Well, good morning, church family. It is great to be here and great to see everyone out. We want to begin with a word of prayer before we get into our class this morning. And I'm going to ask Brother Randall, if he would, to come and lead us in the prayer. And then we will get started. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we are so thankful for this day that you've given us. Thankful for the every blessing of life that you bestow upon us. We're thankful for this opportunity to come together, to study from your word, to hear another lesson from your word. And we ask at this time that you would remember those that are sick, uh, and not able to be with us, uh, uh, wherever they might be, we ask your blessings upon them. And we offer you our thanks for those that have been in hospitals and different places and are doing better. We offer you our, our thanks for that. We pray that you would watch over this, this nation. We ask that you would, that our leaders might turn to you for the example that we so desperately need. Pray that you would bless David as he has a lesson for us today. Bless him as he goes day to day. And pray that everything will, will work to his good. We ask that you would go with us now as we enter into this service. And we ask in Jesus' name, amen. In that beautiful prayer so very much. You know, as I look outside, I can't help but think of yesterday. Yesterday it rained and stormed and thundered and lightning. And you know they say that lightning is the way that the atmosphere explained out and I think that yesterday God cleaned out the atmosphere so that we could enjoy a beautiful Lord's Day as we have today and how blessed we all are to be here and to be able to open up the greatest book that has ever been known to me in the Bible and see what God has to say to us. Remember that we are in the book of First Peter chapter 3. And though these Christians are suffering persecution, Peter gives them a word of encouragement. Chapter 3, he encourages them to be a blessing. And we have seen that they are to be a blessing in their marriage relationships, in brotherhood, and also, as you and I were looking at, even in times of suffering. So what we were doing is we had made it down to verse 18. And what we are doing is noticing how that these verses pair with one another. Peter uses the greatest example on suffering, and that is that of Jesus 
Christ. You remember in verses 13 and 14, he said to them that when you suffer, make sure that you're suffering for good. In other words, suffer for righteousness sake. And likewise, in verse 18, we saw that's exactly the reason that Jesus suffered. He suffered because he was righteous, not because that he had ever committed a sin, but he suffered solely because of the fact that he was a righteous person. In the second place, we saw that Peter said that you and I, if we're going to be a blessing in times of suffering, that we need to be prepared to preach. We need to be prepared to give an answer for the way that we live our lives here on earth. And we saw, if you remember, in the next verse, in verses 18 to 20, that's exactly what Christ did. He preached, but not just in his lifetime, but we also saw that he preached through the preaching of Noah even during his days. Now, that brings us to the next point. Peter encouraged them, if you remember, in verse 16, to make sure in their suffering that they had a good conscience. And likewise, that's what you see in verse 21, where Peter says, there is also an antidote which now saves us, baptism, not the removal of the field of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so Peter encourages in this verse to make sure that we have a clear conscience with God. And what does Peter say that we must do if we are going to have a clear conscience with God? We must be baptized. Why is that? Peter plainly says that baptism does what? It saved us. And Peter goes on to say that it's not the removal of the filth of the flesh. Many people who do not believe in the Bible teaching of baptism will say those people in the Church of Christ believe that all their sins are floating around in that water in the baptistry. And that is not true. Notice, if you will, that we have a clear conscience, not because baptism is a removal of filth of the flesh, but it is an answer of a good conscience toward God. It lets us know that we have done 
what God wants us to do. And when people say, how can you know that you are saved? You can say, because this is what the Bible teaches. Now, I am not up here advocating baptism. That's what people accuse us of doing. I am advocating Bible teaching. And the Bible teaches that baptism saves. And notice, if you will, in the context of the scripture that Peter referred to it as an antitype. The King James has the word light figure. In other words, it's a comparison. Comparison to what? Back up, if you will, into verse uh Verse 20, and it refers to the days of Noah. While the ark was preparing, in which, look at what it says, eight souls were saved, how? Through water. Let me ask you a question. Did water play a part in their salvation? Yes, it did. How do I know that? Well, the Bible says it right here, plain and simple. Through water, they were saved both physically and spiritually because Everyone outside the ark, they died physically, but they also died how? Spiritually. How do I know that? Because remember in Second Peter 2 and verse 4 that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. And if they did not listen to Noah in his preaching, then they were lost. The only place where you could be saved, both physically and spiritually, was on that ark. And those who were on the ark, they were saved. Because God took the waters of the flood and he lifted up that ark and he cleansed the world. <clears throat> what did he cleanse the world of? Do you remember? Do you remember? that when God decided that he was going to bring the flood upon the earth, it was because he looked upon man and the wickedness of man was only evil continually. It was because of the sinfulness of man that God brought the flood upon the earth. And so those flood waters served to save Noah and his family and to also cleanse the earth from sin. Now, with that thought in mind, they were saved through water. Now go back know what Peter said in verse 21 there is an antitype there is a light figure in other words in the very same way 
that God used martyr to save the people in the days of Noah. God uses water to save mankind from the sin. And that water is contacted in the waters of baptism. Let's go to Mark chapter 16 and verse 16. And someone read it, if you will. <laughs> Does that verse not plainly teach that one must believe and be baptized in order to be saved? Yes, it does. Let's go to Acts 2 and verse 38. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Why were the people in the days of Peter and the apostles, why were they told to be baptized in order to have the remission of sin. Let's go to Acts 22 and verse 16. passage, it washes away our sins. I recently was listening to a Bible program on GBM, and they were answering error concerning baptism. And this man had the audacity to say, that the teaching of baptism is a slap in the face to the gospel and the whole Bible. I'm going to tell you something, folks. Based upon what we just read, and remember in Mark 16, in verse 16, who is doing the speaking? It's Jesus. And Jesus said, we must believe and be baptized to say that one can be saved and not be baptized is a slap in the face of Jesus Christ and all the teaching of the Bible. It's not just those books. But there are many other books that teach the importance of salvation. Let's go to Second Timothy chapter two and verse ten. Second Timothy two and verse ten. Now, according to that verse, what is salvation, fam? In Christ Jesus, would anybody argue against that? No, because remember that Peter said in Acts 4 in verse 12, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name 
under heaven, given among men, whereby we must be saved. So, salvation is in Christ Jesus, right? Now, how is it that we get into Christ Jesus? Go to Romans chapter 6, and let's read verse 3. Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? How is it that we get into Christ according to that verse? We are baptized. Let's go to Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 and 27. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. Now, there are two passages which says that we are baptized into Christ. Now, remember 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 10. Why is it that I want to be in Christ Jesus? Because salvation is there. How is it that I get into Christ? It is only through the act of baptism. Go to Acts chapter 2 and verse 47. Someone read it. Praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Where did God put the same people in the church? Let's go to Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 23. Ephesians 5 23. Okay, that verse says that Jesus is the Savior of the what? The body. What is the body? Just back up into Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. And he put all things under his feet and gave them to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. The church is the what? Is the body. Okay. So, back in Ephesians 5.23, if Jesus is the Savior of the body, the Bible is actually saying that he is the Savior of the what? The church, okay? How is it that you get into the church? Because only those who are in the church are going to be saved. Let's go to First Corinthians Chapter 12, verses 12 and 13. For as the body is one, and hath many members, and all the members of that one body being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by 
one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles or whether we be bond or free, and have uh, been all made to drink into one spirit. How did they get into that one body which is the church? Both to undermine the teaching of baptism is to undermine the entire teaching of the Bible. I could spend the rest of the morning just going from verse to verse to verse, but I think what we have seen suffices the matter. And I am not downplaying faith. This uh, individual who was teaching false doctrine, he was saying that faith is all you must have in order to be saved. And I agree that faith is extremely important. In fact, the Hebrew writer would say, without faith, can we please God? No. Hebrews 11 and verse 6. But in saying that faith is the only requirement, what about repentance? Does not the Bible teach that we must repent? Acts 17.30 In the time of this ignorance, God went that. But now, command us, command us, all men everywhere to repent. What about our confession of Jesus as Lord and Savior? Matthew 10. 32 and 33, those are things that we must do if we're going to be children of God. This man, let me tell you how crazy he was. He spent the entire documentary saying that faith was the only thing that we had to do to be saved. And then, in the end, he said, get this, there's nothing that you and I can do to be saved. And so, the man had lost his mind, I do believe, because he spent his entirety trying to downplay baptism and upplay faith. And then he concluded with the fact that there's nothing you and I can do. Well, I am puzzled because remember in Acts chapter 2 and verse 37, Let's go there and read that passage. Acts 2 and verse 37. And now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? What are the people? asking Peter and the rest of the apostles, is there something we can do? Now, in verse 38, Peter said, there's nothing you can do. You must just rely on the grace and goodness of God. Is that what Peter said? When they ask the question, what must we do? Peter responded by saying, repent and be baptized. 
Let me ask you this. Why didn't he begin with the words here and believe? Because number one, they had already heard the message and the fact that they are asking, what do we need to do? implies they believed the message and they were willing to repent. They were willing to change their lives. And so Peter says that you and I can have a good conscience by making sure that we have been baptized for the remission of our sins. Now, back to verse 17. In verse 17, Peter says, Suffer, because this is the will of God. Remember the kind of suffering that Peter is encouraging them to do is suffer for righteousness sake. And Peter said that when you suffer for doing good, this is the will of God. And you can pair that, if you will, to verse 22, who has gone into heaven. And that's talking about Jesus, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers having been made subject to him. And when you look at everything that this verse is saying about Jesus, this was according to the will of God. Remember in Matthew 28 and verse 18 that Jesus said, All authority or all power is given unto me. In the reason that the Father gave all authority to Jesus is so that we could all be subject unto him, that we could fall before him and give him allegiance in this life that we live. Now, I find it interesting that as you think about this passage, remember that it is by encouraging us to be subject to Jesus. Look, if you will, back to verse 1. And how did it begin? Wives are to be what? Subject or submissive to their husband. Remember that this whole chapter is about being a blessing. How is it that you and I can be a blessing in our marriages by being subject to Christ. How is it that we can be a blessing in the brotherhood by being subject to Christ? And how is it that we can be a blessing when it comes to suffering again by being subject to Christ. That is the key to being a great blessing in the life 
Let me live. Now, that brings us to the first bell. And that brings us to chapter 4. And by means of introduction, I think we can do that. And then, maybe next Sunday, we can get into verse 1. As you remember, <laughs> as you remember, this whole book is written to Christians who are suffering. And when you and I look at chapter 4, one of the words that you're going to see pop off the page in that chapter is the word suffer. You're going to see it for a total of six times in this chapter. Twice in verse 1, verse 13, verse 15, 16, in verse 19, you see the word suffer. Then remember that there is a pattern that we have been seeing. Every time that the Bible writer refers to the suffering of Christians, who does he remind them of? The Christ, right? And so, when you look at verse 1, guess how Peter starts this chapter. Therefore, since Christ suffered. Now, what is the purpose of this chapter. I think it can be seen in verse 19. In verse 19, Peter said, Therefore, let those who suffer and watch this according to the will of God. What kind of suffering is according to the will of God? Well, as we have already seen in chapters 2 and 3, it's suffering because we are righteous. It's suffering because of the good that we do. With that thought in mind, Look at what Peter said. Commit their souls to him in doing good as a faithful creator. In this chapter, Peter is saying, trust in God <coughs> and keep on doing good. That word commit means simply to trust. And Peter is saying, if you are going to be the Christian that you need to be, then even during times of suffering, you just trust in the Lord and keep on doing good. Now, what is the result when you and I keep on doing good and trusting that God is going to take care of everything. Someone read verse 11. What's going to happen when you and I keep on 
doing good. God is going to be glorified. You see that again in verse 14. And then you see it again in verse 16. So when you and I keep on doing good, God is going to be glorified. And isn't that our goal in life? Our goal in life is to glorify God. And so when you and I keep on doing good, doing suffering, we are going to glorify God. Now, we will talk about the rest of the chapter, Lord willing, next week.
Especially all of our visitors, so glad to have you. And we pray you'll please come back and be with us every opportunity that you have. Uh, Jesse uh, Teague and his family are down in Laurel, Mississippi this morning, worshiping down that way. And he asked me to do the announcements, and so we'll try to do that. I'd like to go over our prayer list before we begin, and then we'll, or before we have other announcements. Uh, let's remember uh, Brother David Payton in our daily prayers, morning, noon, and night, and let's pray for him and uh, his family and Kelly that things will be better for them. This morning, we're blessed to have Brother Terrell Pettyjohn back with us. So he's been in the hospital quite some time. And so he's home from the NR, uh, NHC nursing facility. And Terrell is doing really, really good. It's reported. In fact, he's he's got a card here for us, a very beautiful card we'll put back here on the card. Thank you for your help, it says. Thoughtf thoughtfulness just seems to be a special part of you. Thanks for all the help and that you give and for being so kind too. And thank you for all the cards and thank you for all the help you gave me in Christian love, Terrell Pettyjohn and family. So we appreciate that card. Let's remember Angela McCauley is on hospice, but she is in good spirits and she's showing the Christian light. Angela McCauley is. Sister Joyce Wright is recovering from surgery. She's with us this morning, her and Lloyd Wright. So we're so very glad to have them this morning. Uh, James Moore is in the hospital at Park Ridge. He's got a blood clot in his right lung. So let's remember James Moore. Also, uh, Joel Brumlow had a fall, and he's recovering from that fall. Uh, Ruth Crow uh, called this morning, and she's not feeling so good, so she said she's not going to be here this morning, but please remember her, Ruth Crow. Also, uh, Gabby Sessions' cousin, Deborah Scott, down in Pensacola, Florida. Gabby's been down there quite a bit trying to help her, and uh, she needs prayers. That's Deborah Scott. She stayed in the hospital uh, down there in Pensacola, Florida, room 135. Also, Sister Bobby England needs her prayers. She has health issues following her surgery on June the 8th, and her mother, Rebecca Edwards, was recently diagnosed with breast cancer, so uh, they're having lots of troubles. So please uh, uh, play, pray for Bobby England and uh, Rebecca. Uh, Rebecca's going to be having a mastectomy on Friday, January the 7th. Uh, let's remember that Wanda Gray is going to be going to Nashville for a heart valve surgery very soon. So let's pray for Wanda. She has an appointment July 18th to set up uh, the trip to Nashville for this heart valve surgery. It'll be Wanda Gray. Our youth-led worship will be today at 5 o'clock at our worship this afternoon. And also right after the worship, we'll have Group 1 Compassion Card signing uh, following the worship. We're coming up on next Saturday, our door knocking for the uh, new moves, the people that move in the community. So we'll be here, we can meet here at 2, 2 p.m. on next Saturday for door knocking. We'll have a list of names and some uh, information to be sent out to these folks. That's a wonderful way for evangelism. If you, if you want a, a, a way to do evangelism and, it's, and you can get a little bit of time, next Saturday at 2 o'clock would be a good time. And it's fairly easy to do. You can go with somebody who knows how to do it. If you want to, you can ride along and learn evangelism. Teen singing a Sunday, uh, June the 9th at Dayton, Tennessee. The Group 2 Compassion Card signing was is, uh, Sunday, July the 16th following the evening worship. Uh, we are announcing the 2023 fall term of Chattanooga School of Preaching and Biblical Studies. It's going to be Monday, and the classes are at Greens Lake Road starting August the 21st through November the 13th. It'll be 13 weeks. So please see more, more details posted on the bulletin board about the Chattanooga School of Preaching if you would like to attend that and learn much more about how to preach God's Word. Youth Lectures... Uh, or Saturday, August the 5th, hosted by Greens Lake Road Church of Christ. The theme is Cultivating Respect. Please see the bulletin board for more details on youth lectures at Greens Lake Road. Uh, family Youth Activity sign-up sheet for 2023 is on the board back there. If you would like to host the youth for one of the month activities, uh, please uh, take a look at the board and sign up and choose a month that you can uh, be with these young people 
and it will energize you. If you're like me, a little bit older, and you want to be energized, just invite those uh, teens for an activity, and you kind of head it up. They will energize you. We appreciate all you teens, you wonderful, wonderful youth here in LaFayette. This morning, uh, opening prayer will be by Brother Frank Sintel, closing prayer of Brian Pettyjohn, scripture reading, Jimmy Dodson, and uh, Johnny Johnson will begin our service with singing, and then right after the singing, the Lord's Supper, we'll have some of the finest preaching that you'll ever hear through one of the greatest preachers in the brotherhood, Brother David Payton. So now we'll start our worship and singing, Brother Johnson. Say good morning, everybody. Fifty-five, number fifty-five, be the first song this this morning. We're saying verses one through three, page fifty-five. Again, they're saying. We are readings from Galatians 5 1 stand fast therefore in the liberty by which Christ has made us free and do not be entangled again with a yoke of bondage Five and five, same verses 1 through 3 it may sound a little different if I sang it but everybody can tell me it's a different I will say that, yep, that's it. The Lord our rock in here we have a different kind of
pray with me. Tell the Father for those that have been mentioned this morning that are hurting, those that are sick, those that have health problems, we pray. Tell the Father that you will bless them and every and all their health uh, health problems they may have. Bless others that are recovered or are recovering. Pray that you will help them and bless them in their health and help us find opportunities to lift our hands up to help them and do whatever we can to encourage them. And Heavenly Father, for that day when there was darkness over the whole land for three hours, we thank you for that. Thank you that Jesus that day was willing to give his life on the cross. We may have hope of heaven. Thank you for the church that he purchased with his blood. And thank you that we can be members of that church and help us to live a life that you'd be pleased with. Help us to seek out those that we can help and teach your word to. Help us to be kind and considerate to others. Help us always to do your will and put you first. Heavenly Father, for the great country that we live in, we thank you for that. And pray, Heavenly Father, that, that we can encourage others to, to be more civil, where our leaders may make decisions that would be best for this country. Bless them and, and help us to encourage others to serve you. Bless us in all that we do. Be with us today as we come here together to worship you. We pray that we may worship you in spirit and in truth. Thank you for David and his, and his desire to serve you, to teach your word, and we pray that you will bless him in his health. Bless him this morning as he brings a lesson and be well fitted for this occasion. Help us always seek to do your will. Bless the world leaders, Heavenly Father, that, that they may lead wisely, that your people may have the freedom to worship and serve you if it's your will, Heavenly Father. Help us always to do your will. Bless each one, each member of this church. Pray that we may be a great congregation of your people, that we may do those things that would encourage others to serve you and, and encourage one another to live for you. Bless the teachers of the classes. Bless all that's done. And for those that do things that may be known to the church, we pray that you will bless them. Bless us as we worship you today. Forgive us. Bless us through the day in Christ's name. Amen.
this first day of the week, and we have this opportunity each each first day of the week, as the Bible instructs us to come together to remember the death and the suffering of our Savior. And we want to take just a moment to think about the price He paid for us. You know, we learn uh, starting in Genesis 3 where sin entered into the world. And of course, God never intended for man to be lost. Uh, he had uh, the, the plan for us. Uh, we know that down through the ages, uh, sacrifices were made. Uh, but the Bible tells us that the blood of bulls and goats could not take away sin. It took the innocent blood of, of God's own Son, Jesus, to take away our sin and make it possible for us to be, uh, to be saved. We read that uh, where He came to this world and He left us instructions that that we're to come together on the first day of the week, each week, to remember the the death and suffering of Jesus. Now we use that phrase quite a, quite often, but we just sang about what all Jesus went through, uh, going on going to the cross, God's only Son. We try to imagine that. Of course, we can't. We can't fathom that because uh, those of us who have a son, there's not a one of us in here would give that son up. But we don't have the kind of love that God had for us and that Jesus had for us. God sent His Son and Jesus willingly came to this earth. He had his earthly ministry, and we know that he eventually was crucified for our sins. And we need to remember that that was for each and every one of us. It gets personal when we think of it that way. Jesus died for me. He died for you. Uh, that we might have an opportunity to uh, to have uh, salvation and the hope of heaven. I want to read uh, some verses here that, that we're all familiar with, but just try to picture in your mind what, we're, what, what uh, was happening at this time. This is where Jesus was uh, taken and he was about to be crucified. Matthew 27, beginning in verse 27, it says, Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the common hall and gathered unto him the whole band of soldiers. And they stripped him and put on him a scarlet robe. And when they had plaited a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head and a reed in his right hand, and they bowed the knee before him, and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spit upon him, and took the reed, and smote him on the head. And after that they had mocked him, they took the robe off him, and put on his, his raiment on him, and led him away to be crucified. And as they came out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name, and him they compelled to bear his cross. And when they were coming to a place called Golgotha, that is to say, a place of a skull, they gave him vinegar to drink mingled with gall, and when he had tasted thereof, he would not drink. And they crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lots. Hopefully we can 
in some way try to visualize that in our in our minds and again remind ourselves that this is what uh, Jesus did for us because of the love that that God had for us, the love that Jesus had for us. So at this time, let's offer thanks for the for the bread this morning. Our Father in heaven, we're so very thankful for this opportunity we have to come together on each first day of the week to partake of this feast. We ask your blessings be on this bread as we partake of it, as we remember the body of our Savior. We pray that you would bless it and bless us. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Let's bow again and offer thanks for the fruit of the vine. Again, our Father, we offer you our thanks for this, the fruit of the vine, as we're reminded of the shed blood of Jesus that he shed for each of us. We pray that you would bless it and bless us. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.
that uh, concludes our observing the Lord's Supper this, this morning. Again, like I say, we have it uh, have that opportunity every week. We come to another part of our service this morning where we are, have the opportunity to give back to the Lord a portion of those uh, the blessings He gives us. And uh, we have have that opportunity again every every uh, once a week. And this is a very a very generous congregation. It's amazing how kind and generous we all are. We have that opportunity to not only help one another, but to help spread the gospel. And our elders are very wise in and what they do, and we have that that chance now to give back. I want to read just briefly Second uh, uh, Corinthians. It says, "But this I say: He which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully." Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give. Not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. And we now have that opportunity and let's bow and offer thanks. Our Father in heaven, we're thankful again for this opportunity we have to give back a portion of the, the many, many blessings that you give us. And we know that you love a cheerful giver. And we pray that each one will give as they've been prospered. And we thank you for this opportunity in Jesus' name. Amen. Rotate and come forward. The same 243. 243. The same first, second, third person. 243. Then we'll have Come forward. Together as same. If for the prize we ask to give us a actor.
So great to see everyone out. Couldn't think of a better place in all the world to be than right here with the good folks of the Lafayette Church of Christ. As you all know, this upcoming Tuesday is July the 4th, and that day is recognized in the United States of America as our day of independence, a day when you and I celebrate freedom. And that is a blessing that we truly take for granted. I do believe in the world today. It is because of our freedom that we are all able to gather here today and practice New Testament Christianity. And if that is not a reason to be thankful for freedom, then I cannot for the life of me think of a better one. But as you and I think about freedom as a Christian, I think of a freedom that is even greater than the physical freedom that we get to enjoy. And that is the spiritual freedom that we are blessed to enjoy every day of our lives as Christians. And I want us to think about the freedom that we get to enjoy as Christians. And I want us to begin by thinking about the great power of the freedom we get to enjoy. When you think about the power in the freedom that we enjoy. But what I'm talking about is that you and I are free from sin. That's the greatest freedom 
that I can tell people about. Not that I am a citizen of the United States of America, but I am a citizen of the Lord's Church. And because I am a citizen of that beautiful kingdom, then I have been free from sin. That was the message of the Apostle Paul in the book of Romans chapter 6. In verse 7, 18, and 22, he made it clear that his subject of discussion was the fact that as Christians we have been free from sin. And again, can you think of a greater freedom in all the world than to be able to lay down tonight and say, Praise God Almighty, because I have been free from sin. You and I, when we think about freedom from sin, we need to understand, first of all, that we are free from the power of sin. Sin as a Christian, a sin, because you and I are Christians, sin does not dominate our lives no more. At one time, sin did reign in my life and in your life, but as a Christian, we are those who walk in the light as he is in the light, and we do not let sin reign in our mortal bodies, as Paul would say in Romans 6, in verse 12, in a sense, I guess you can say that you and I have quit sin. We have stopped dating sin, entertaining sin. We have kicked sin to the curb, and we no longer want it a part of our lives. But in the second place, we are free from the guilt of sin. Every time that you and I sin, you know the guilt that comes with it. David understood that guilt when he wrote in Psalm 51 and verse 3, For I acknowledge my transgression. And look at what David said. My sin is always before me. Do you see that guilt? When you and I commit sin, all oh, the guilt and all oh, the shame that we feel. But when we have been free from sin, then every sin that we have ever committed is taken away, and no more does the guilt of sin weigh upon us. It's like what John said in First John 1 and verse 7, If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of his son, watch what it does. It cleanses us from all sin. And the word cleanses there means a continuous action. As long as I walk in the light, I am cleansed from sin, and I do not have to bear the guilt of sin in the life that I live. 
And even when I make a mistake, as John says, he forgives us our sin and cleanses us from all unrighteousness when we confess those sins. And so we are free from the power of sin and the guilt of sin, but in the third place, we are free from the consequence of sin. What is the ultimate consequence of sin? It is death, is it not? And the death that Paul had in mind in this passage, Romans 6, in verse 23, is spiritual death. Isn't it great to know that I will not die in sin because I have been free from sin. And so when you and I think about sin, the Bible teaches us or we think about freedom. The Bible teaches us that we are free from sin. The Bible also says that we are free from fear. You know what fear is, don't you? It can best be defined as false evidence that appears real. The Bible teaches us that as God's people, God has not given us the spirit of fear, but rather he has given us the spirit of, uh, of power. And when you and I are Christians, we do not have to fear anything in this life. We do not have to fear the devil. Why people run around to scare the death of the devil and what he's going to do to us. Listen, the devil has already been defeated. He has been destroyed. In the book of Hebrews 2, in verse 14, the Bible says, In this much them, as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same that through death he might destroy him, don't miss that, destroy him who had the power of death, who is what? The devil. That's not that verse teach that Jesus destroyed the dominion of the devil. Listen, the only control that the devil has in your life is that what you give him. And so Jesus has defeated him. Not only that, the Bible says that you and I can resist the devil. In James 4, in verse 7, the Bible says, Therefore, submit to God, and don't miss what James says. Resist the devil, and what will he do? He will flee from you. This verse teaches that the devil can be resisted, and if he is resisted, what happens? He flees from us. 
that teaches me that when the devil is active in my life, it's only because I have not submitted to God and resisted him. When you and I turn our lives over to God, we have the power to resist the devil. And one of my favorite is found in the book of First John 2 and verse 13, where the Bible says, I write to you fathers because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to you young men don't miss, please don't miss what John said because you have overcome the wicked one. Now, let me ask you this. What is the difference between you and me and these people that John was writing to in the first century? Nothing. And if these people could overcome the evil one, can you and I overcome him too? You see, the devil has been dominated. He can be resistant. And he can be overcome. And we do not have to fear him. But also, we do not have to fear defeat. There are times in our lives when we feel as if we have been defeated as Christians, right? It may be a trial. It may be some kind of affliction. It may be a persecution. But as Christians, faithful Christians, we never have to fear a failing. It reminds me <coughs> of just this past week. Monday was not my best day. In fact, I have a choking spell Monday, and my wife had to call 911. And after I got better, I told her, I said, you know, I really thought that I was going to die because I couldn't breathe. And you know what she said? Not on my watch. Let me tell you something, but we say as Christians, we are going to fail. And you know what Jesus says? Not on my watch. As long as we have him in our lives, we never have to fear defeat. Why? Because the power of God that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. Where is that power working in me, in you, in us as Christians? And that's why the Apostle Paul would say, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Philippians 4 in verse 13. You and I do not have to fear the devil. We do not have to fear defeat. And finally, we don't have to fear death. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to give you a false hope. Death is an appointment 
that we are all going to keep if we don't live until the coming of Christ. Hebrews 9 and verse 27 tells us that it's an appointment that you are going to keep. But you and I have hope that there is life after death. Yes, this old body is corruptible. Yes, this old body is decaying every day. But when I die in Christ Jesus, free from sin, I have hope that I will rise from the grave again just as Jesus did, knowing that he who raised up the Lord Jesus will also raise us up with Jesus and will present us with you. What hope that you and I have as Christians because we are free from sin and we are free from fear. But in the second place, I want you to consider with me, if you will, the process of freedom. How is it that I become free? The Bible says in John 8, 32, <laughs> And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. The only way that you and I can be free from sin and free from fear is if we are filled to the greatest book in the world, and that is the Word of God, the Bible. And when we are filled to the Bible, then you and I can be free from the sin in our lives. I call you a teacher. The Romans chapter 6, uh, uh, verse 17, where Paul will say, But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, look what happened. Yet you obey from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered to you. What was that doctrine that Paul had in mind? This book, the Bible, the very book that you and I have today, that we live our life by. And when we obey the teachings of the Bible, look at what the Bible says. And having been set free from sin, you became the slaves of righteousness. So the process or the way to which you and I are free from sin and free from a fear is when we obey the teachings of the Bible. Now finally, Know the place of freedom. And the place of freedom is only in Christ Jesus. In Galatians 2 and verse 4, And this occurred because false brethren secretly brought in who came in by still to spy out our liberty, which it says, which we have where? In Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. It is only through Christ and being 
in Christ Jesus and be <laughs> so in Galatians 5 in verse 1 that you and I can have true freedom or true liberty and so the greatest freedom is the freedom that you and I enjoy in Christ Jesus. Now, if true freedom is found only in Christ Jesus, before I leave here this morning, where do I want? Where do I want to be found? I want to be found in Christ Jesus. And so, how is it that the Bible teaches that we get into Christ Jesus? In the book of Romans 3, in Romans 6, in verse 3, the Bible says, Know you not that so many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. How did those people get into Christ Jesus? It was through the act of baptism. And so I appeal to you, we appeal to you this morning, if you want freedom from sin, if you want freedom from fear, if you want the freedom that gives you the confidence that you have salvation, then won't you come this morning believing that Jesus is a son of God, repenting of your sins, confessing your faith in Christ as a son of God, and being baptized for the remission of your sins, baptized into Christ Jesus, and leave here with the freedom that he promises us this very morning. If you need to respond to the invitation for any reason, would you come as we stand and as we sing?
Father in heaven, we are once again thankful for this day, thankful that you have spared all of our lives up until this moment in time and granted us the opportunity to be in that right relationship with you. And we do rejoice with the angels in heaven over these two who have come forward, who have seen sin in their life and they want to be rid of it. And we pray that you will help us to Help them to rid their, their lives of this sin. We know that you forgive them. We pray that you will help them to walk more closely with thee each day. They will stay diligent in the study of your word so that they will know how to live their lives in a pleasing manner before thee. We pray that you will be with us all as we journey along life's way. We know that there are many sins and temptations that are put before us. We know that you have provided a way for us to overcome. And we pray that we will always look for that way of escape and that we will always walk in light of your word and be found faithfully following you. Be with us throughout our days and when we come to the end of life's way, we pray we will live eternally with thee. In your just name. Amen. Four verses. Yes, everybody, please make it come out five o'clock this evening. Leaving the service tonight. Come out and support you. Also, please tonight at 7 p.m. Uh, and uh, once somebody sign a car or something, so group one after the service, after the morning service, tonight yeah. Tonight is at the evening service. Group one be signing a car. Okay, Two hundred fifty-five. First four verses. Yep. I am resolved no longer to linger on my world's divide. The things that are higher, the things that are nobler, these have the good on my side. Oh,
Let us go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and the many blessings you bestow upon us. Heavenly Father, we thank you most for sending our Son Jesus and his willingness to come that we have the hope of heaven when this life is over. Heavenly Father, bless the sick and the afflicted according to thy will, those that are sick physically and those that are sick spiritually. Heavenly Father, we thank you for those that were sick and back with us, continue to bless their health. Heavenly Father, bless the church here at Lafayette, and let us strive to do thy will always in the community. Heavenly Father, bless Brother David Payton as he labors here. He is a great blessing to this congregation, and we really enjoy having him here. Heavenly Father, bless our elders, and they make the best decisions for us here at the congregation. They're a real blessing to us. Heavenly Father, forgive us of our shortcomings, forgive us of our sins, and forgive those who sin against us. Heavenly Father, be with our political leaders. Let them turn to thy word for guidance that we might have a great country one of these days again. Heavenly Father, be with the leaders the world over, especially in Ukraine and Russia, as they're fighting a senseless war over nothing. Be with them and peace may be come to them soon. Heavenly Father, bless us as we depart in Jesus' name. Amen.